Now let's look at the next slide. This is why are these popular? Same question, same observation circa 2005. But now this observation is made in this overeating paradigm, this energy balance. Um, and you can see, I want to just show you how the, what happens with, once you uh, put that bias in there. This is Benjamin Caballero, Director of Center for Human Nutrition at Hopkins. He writes an article in the New England Journal of Medicine called A Nutrition Paradox, Underweight and Obesity in Developing Countries. This is this uh, combination we've been talking about since we've seen since 1928. He says, a few years ago, I was visiting a primary care clinic in the slums of Sao Paulo, Brazil. The waiting room is full of mothers with thin, stunted young children exhibiting the typical signs of chronic undernutrition. Their appearance, sadly, would surprise few who visit poor urban areas in the developing world. What might come as a surprise that many of the mothers holding those undernourished infants were themselves overweight. And then he says, the coexistence of underweight and overweight poses a challenge to public health programs since the aims of programs to reduce undernutrition, get people to eat more, are obviously in conflict with those for obesity prevention get people to eat less. And the reason I put poses a challenge to public health programs in italics is because this observation poses a challenge to your paradigm, okay? If you have obese mothers with starving children, and you believe that the obese mothers got that way by eating too many calories, superfluous calories, then you believe that they're willing to starve their children to death, allow their children to starve so they could sneak outside and affect and eat Snickers bars when nobody's looking. And to me, if you have obese mothers with thin-stunted young children, you can't believe in the overeating hypothesis because we can't believe that mothers, you know, that our paradigm of maternal love is that mothers will do anything for their children. They won't eat excess food that their children need to survive. So, in effect, you're asking, what's it going to be? Are we going to throw out our paradigm of obesity, or are we going to throw out our paradigm of maternal love? And because my mother would roll over in her grave if I didn't do this, I'm going to throw out the obesity paradigm. Let's look at some other inconvenient facts. Skip to slide 22. Okay, these are just other observations that make us question our overeating hypothesis. The first one is that Calorie-restricted diets don't really work. Um, if you look at calorie-restricted semi-starvation diets, you look at a meta-analysis, I always use the Cochrane collaboration, if I can, for meta-analyses because they're designed to be unbiased. What you get is weight loss achieved in clinical trials is, quote, so small as to be clinically insignificant. And what's interesting is since they wrote that in 2002, since that review was done, what's basically happened is physicians now like to say if you can get five pounds of weight loss, that's clinically significant so we could change our description of what clinically significant is. But weight loss in clinical trials of semi-starvation diets is invariably very small, if anything. Um, and by semi-starvation diets, I mean calorie-restricted diets where you cut calories down to you know, roughly a third to a half of what you were eating prior to the diet. Um, if you notice, there was a study of low-carb versus low-fat diets that was published two weeks ago. And the low-fat diet was calorie-restricted. It was a semi-starvation diet where women were supposed to keep under 1,500 calories a day and men under 1,800. Um, what you get with this problem is this kind of inconsistency in the literature. And if you look at um, what I mean by that, I gave, my example is a handbook of obesity, which was published in 1998. It was edited by George Bray and Claude Bouchard and... Um, one other fellow, who's, you know, these are the biggest names in obesity research. And the chapter on dietary therapy for obesity has a line that says, dietary therapy remains the cornerstone of treatment and the reduction of energy intake continues to be the basis of successful weight reduction programs. And then about two paragraphs later, you see them say the results of dietary therapy are known to be poor and not long-lasting. And in a functioning science, if you ever got to the point where you wrote that dietary therapy was a cornerstone of treatment and then had to write that the results are known to be poor and not long-lasting, you would ask yourself, what are we doing wrong? What are we missing? What don't we understand? Let's look at the next slide, which is should this come as a surprise that eating less doesn't work much? Um, and Hilda Brook, who was the leading expert in pediatric obesity in the mid-20th century from the the late 30s through the early 70s, put it this way. She said, more than in any other illness, a physician treating the obese patient is called upon only to do a special trick, 
to make the patient do something, stop eating after it has already been proved that he cannot do it. Everybody knows that they're supposed to eat less when they're obese. And if they continue to be obese, it means that eating less hasn't worked. They might have tried dozens of times, hundreds of times. They might have woken up every morning in their life wanting to eat less, and they fail to do it. And the question is, why should we even think it should work just because a physician tells them to do it? Or they get put in a randomized control trial and randomized to the eating less arm. Uh, next slide. The way the medical community has dealt with this is to say, okay, well, maybe eating less doesn't work, but surely then exercising more does. Because obesity is an energy pro a balance problem, so if you're taking in too much, if you're taking in more energy than you expend, maybe the problem is you're not expending enough. And I could quote meta-analyses here, but what I prefer to use is this quote from the American Heart Association, the American College of Sports Medicine. In 2007, they published physical activity guidelines and these people are people who want us to exercise. They're very dedicated to that. So you could assume that they're going to do everything they can to slant the evidence towards the benefits of exercise. And what they said about this question of exercise and weight loss is this. They said it's reasonable to assume that persons with relatively high daily energy expenditures would be less likely to gain weight over time compared with those who have low energy expenditures. So another way to put that is it's reasonable to assume that somebody who's a couch potato will be less likely to gain weight over time if they start training for the New York Marathon. Um, they increase their energy expenditure, and then they say, so far, data to support this hypothesis are not particularly compelling. And the point is that hypothesis is at least a, is at least a century old. Um, you could date it to the early 1900s when this German diabetes specialist von Norden put forth the idea that obesity was caused by taking in too many calories and expending too few. You could actually go back to the 1860s when William Banting, was it William? I can't remember now. Um, Banting, who wrote the first low-carb diet book, said, you know, one of the ways he tried to exercise, he had a doctor friend who said, look, you got to exercise more if you're obese, so he went out rowing. Um, if you have a 100 or 150-year-old hypothesis, and the best you could say about it is that the data to support it are not particularly compelling, the point is you have to entertain the possibility that the hypothesis is just wrong. Maybe exercise and physical activity have nothing causal to do with obesity. And so the reason you can't get people to lose weight by getting them outside exercising is because sedentary behavior isn't the problem. So I'm not saying exercise isn't a good thing for everyone, but what I am saying is that the data that exercise can affect fat accumulation is so poor that we have to question whether or not there's any causal um, link between physical activity or energy expenditure and obesity, or if there is a link, which direction it goes. Let's go to the next slide. Um, the accuracy required to practice energy balance. This is slide 25. Um, we are hear nowadays a lot about people trying to get us to learn how to be in energy balance, how to practice energy balance. There are many problems with that concept. One of the foremost is that your obese patients are in energy balance. If somebody is not actively gaining weight, whether they're obese or they're lean, they're in energy balance, so they're already practicing energy balance. So when we hear that we're supposed to learn how to be in energy balance, what that means we're supposed to stay in energy balance so that we don't gain any more weight. And now, and this is a, a, an equation that I first read about in a 1936 textbook that we're going to get to shortly. But if you eat 2,700 calories a day, that's a good average between men and women. That's equivalent to about a million calories a year, 10 million calories in a decade, 12 tons of food in a decade, okay? it's a lot of food. If you want to maintain your weight to within 10 pounds over the course of a decade, you don't want to go from being 160 to being 170. It requires an accuracy of matching calories in to calories out of better than 0.4%. That's 11 calories a day. If you eat 12 calories a day more than you expend on average, actually I'm going to make it 20 calories a day because I'm going to take in a lot of effects of the thermodynamics and the fact that your body is getting slightly bigger, if you eat 20 calories a day more than you expend, you will gain 10 pounds in a decade. <laughs>